Today, I will be demonstrating and providing a brief description of the Toyota A140e automatic transaxle gear train components and apply devices. First, I will remove the oil pump. This is the band, which is also designated as B1. This wraps around the direct clutch housing and clamps down on the direct clutch, which ultimately ends up holding the sun gear from rotating, causing it to be reactionary. The direct clutch pulls off and inside is a clutch pack that is splined onto the input shaft. Pulling up on the input shaft reveals the forward clutch assembly. We now discover the front ring gear that is splined and fitted into the forward clutch. When fluid pressure comes into the forward clutch, it locks the front ring gear to the input shaft and they will turn together as one unit. Next, the front planetary carrier gear can be removed. Notice the splines. These splines connect the carrier gear to the intermediate power output shaft. The sun gear can now be removed. Notice the metal shell on the sun gear. That is used to tab onto the direct clutch, so if I turn the direct clutch, I also turn the sun gear. Additionally, if I hold the direct clutch, such as with the band, I can hold the sun gear from turning. This is a combination sun gear with one gear in the front and one gear in the rear. This design is specific to the Simpson planetary gear set. Now, I can remove the B2 clutch pack, cylinder, and piston. Note the location groove. This is used to make sure the oil feed hole is properly aligned with the oil feed passageway in the housing. The feed hole needs to be properly aligned to operate the built-in piston. This is the piston and this is the cylinder. This return spring mechanism is used to force the B2 piston back into the cylinder when pressure is relieved. Then the B2 clutch pack can be removed. It's a series of steel and friction discs followed by a thick steel called a flange or pressure plate. Notice the thickness difference between the flange and the steels. Additionally, this flange has a lip on it which makes it directional and in this case, the lip goes down. The B2 clutch pack went around the number one one-way clutch, also designated as F1. The number one one-way clutch sits on the sun gear and interacts with the sun gear. When I hold the number one one-way clutch like this, it allows the sun gear to rotate one way, but prevents the sun gear from rotating the other way. The proper way to view the operation of the one-way clutch is to look at the sun gear from the front of the transmission. You can see while I hold the one-way clutch, the sun gear will turn clockwise, but it will not turn counterclockwise. If I let go of the one-way clutch, the sun gear can rotate in both directions. So, the function of the B2 clutch pack is to hold the outer housing of the one-way clutch to the transmission housing, thus preventing the sun gear from rotating counterclockwise. There is a second one-way clutch known as the number two one-way clutch, or F2. This is a Sprague design with an inner circumference that is fitted to the rear carrier gear and the outer circumference is tabbed to the transmission housing. As I pull off the rear carrier, you can see the planet pinion gears. By placing the one-way clutch back onto the carrier gear, the shiny side must be up to function properly. The other side is dull, so this is directional, and the shiny side goes up. When looking at the gear from the forward direction, and I hold the outer part of the one-way clutch, the carrier gear will turn clockwise but it will not turn counterclockwise. If for some reason the one-way clutch is installed backwards with the dull side up, the rear carrier will now turn counterclockwise and not clockwise. Now the rear ring gear is removed. Note, it too has splines that connects it to the intermediate or output shaft. This means the rear ring gear will turn the output transfer gear 
in addition to the front carrier that I showed you earlier. It too is splined to the intermediate shaft that will turn the output transfer gear. Power can be transmitted through the front carrier or the rear ring gear to turn the output transfer gear. Therefore, the front carrier or the rear ring gear will be a driven gear. The intermediate shaft and transfer gear can be removed from the overdrive housing where we find the overdrive sun gear. On the intermediate shaft, there is another one-way clutch, which is F0, and we can now see that once removed, the transfer gear can rotate independently from the intermediate shaft. I have an intermediate shaft and transfer gear where I have already removed the bearing and nut. Now you can see the overdrive ring gear that is inside of the transfer gear as well as the overdrive carrier that is part of the intermediate output shaft assembly. The intermediate output shaft and overdrive carrier are all one solid assembly. The intermediate shaft and overdrive carrier fit inside the overdrive housing on top of the overdrive sun gear. These screws hold the overdrive brake B0 and when applied will prevent the overdrive sun gear from rotating. There is also an overdrive clutch, C0, in the bottom of the housing and this connects the overdrive sun gear to the overdrive carrier for non-overdrive operation.